Okay, good afternoon again. Uh, we will go ahead and get started. Um, my name is um, Sarav Arunachalam with the UNC Institute for the Environment and also Acting Director here with the um, CMAS Center at Chapel Hill. Uh, we are pleased to continue the CMAS webinar series. This is the third in a row we are having. And today we are delighted to have Professor Peter Adams from Carnegie Mellon University um, give us a webinar on reduced complexity models or RCMs um, to look at um, the impact assessment and um, a tutorial on the same. Some of you may recall him giving a similar tutorial at the 2018 um, CMAS conference. Um, so before um, he gets started, a brief introduction of Professor Adams. He's a professor in the Engineering and Public Policy Department and the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department at Carnegie Mellon University. He also holds an associated faculty position in chemical engineering. Professor Adams' research expertise lies in the development of air quality models, atmospheric particulate matter, climate change, and the application of chemical transport modeling to policy questions. Professor Adams is the director of the Center for Atmospheric Particle Studies at Carnegie Mellon and has served on the EPA's Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee, PM Review Panel, and other advisory committees at the state and local levels. Once again, we're delighted to have Professor Adams give us this webinar, and Peter, it's all yours now. Thanks, Saurabh, for the introduction, and thanks for um, organizing this webinar. Um, so I'm going to dive right in. Uh, there's a lot I'd like to cover. Uh, just truth in advertising up front. Um, uh, what you're getting today is uh, almost identical same tutorial that I gave at the CMAS meeting in 2018. So if you were hoping for a part two, uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you. It's it's same thing with minor updates, but Sarav indicated that a number of people uh, were not able to make it and, and it would be worth doing a similar thing again. Um, so this is kind of the, the things that I would like to um, talk about. Uh, start out really high level, uh, why we dove in and built these reduced complexity models. Uh, second, I want to talk, I want to, uh, you should be able to see a, a laser pointer now. Is that right, Sarav? Not, not yet, Peter. Okay. Um, if you don't see it in another 30 seconds. I see a regular screen. I see a regular pointer, but not the laser one. Oh, it's not the, the maybe, but you see a pointer. Yes, I do see a pointer mole and, and okay. it's gone now, yeah. Okay, great. So second, I'm gonna talk about a few different reduced complexity models that are out there. Um, I wanna spend a little bit, bit of time talking about the evaluation and inner comparison we've done of these models, hopefully to bolster your confidence that these are serious and usable things uh, ready for uh, real analysis. I wanna talk a little bit about um, some nuts and bolts of things that you might need to do and some best practices of things that you should do. Um, and then talk about some of the things that we are doing to try to f uh, further develop uh, these tools. So um, people who know me uh, will know that I've spent most of my career uh, really working on you know, the state of the art chemical transport models. Um, and so a first question people have, have is, well, what are the, I'm gonna use RCM as the acronym, Reduce Complexity Models. Uh, what are they um, about? And uh, first and foremost, the goal in developing reduced complexity models was never really to supplant chemical transport models in any uh, way, shape, or form. Uh, they're always going to be essential. So anytime you're doing, you know, science research on organic chemistry or, you know, processes, um, you're, you're going to really want a, a detailed physical model. I think anytime EPA or a state is thinking about uh, a large rule and wants to do, you know, a, a regulatory impact assessment, I think usually the size of those, or at least for a big rule, the size of those decisions merits using a full-fledged chemical transport model. Um, and, you know, even in a world where we use reduced complexity models a lot, uh, you would want a chemical transport model as the gold standard against which you could benchmark the reduced complexity model. So our goal has never really been to, to push chemical transport models out of any of the applications 
in areas where they're being used right now. Um, and so, you know, sometimes people ask or think about, well, uh, the reduced complexity model is if I don't want to run a chemical transport model, uh, I can get the same answer, but it will, you know, save me 10 times the amount of time or it'll be 100 times faster or save me computer time. Um, I mean, that is maybe true in some sense, but that's not really the way that I look at it. The, our goal in building reduced complexity models was really to uh, fill all the demands where um, chemical transport model CTM doesn't work. Uh, and in particular, this was motivated by a lot of colleagues at Carnegie Mellon who do energy system analysis, that do policy, they want to do cost benefit analysis. Uh, they're never going to run a chemical transport model. Their, their interest and expertise is, is somewhere else. They're looking at a bigger decision problem, but they want to consider the air quality effects as one part uh, of that bigger analysis. Uh, so they're not going to run a CTM, but we wanted to give them something that was very nearly as good. And so we're really trying to hit all those other applications where you would never ever uh, run a chemical transport model. So just some examples, um, you know, when people do a regulatory impact assessment, uh, it's usually for a very specific, well-defined uh, rule or control scenario. At the start of the process, you might want to explore a whole broad range of options. You might want to think about um, dozens or hundreds of different, you know, scenarios and try to narrow down to the best. Reduced complexity models are great for that for optimization Peter, purpose. Can, yes. can I can I interrupt for a second? Yes. The slides don't seem to be advancing. They're still on your title slide. Oh, uh, that's not good. Um, so I see them. You don't see any movement, huh? No, we have been on this um, a title slide with your name and collaborators. From right, the well, let me stop sharing and reshare my screen. Thanks sure. for bringing that to my attention. Um, I see your slide deck now and should be back to the title screen. Yeah. Is it advancing now? Yes. Now, it's, now you're on slide two. Okay. Something got out of sync. Um, okay. So. Um, Thank you. Yep. Good. Uh, we didn't want to go the whole uh, time. And I see your laser pointer too now. Okay. That's good. Um, so for optimization purposes, uh, if you want to put uh, air quality into an integrated assessment model with, say, energy systems uh, and climate and maybe other sort of, ec and ec you know, an economic model, it's a good way to put the air quality component into a broader analysis. Um, if you want to do wider uncertainty analysis than what you can do um, with a chemical transport model, it may be an option. Or... Uh, just some sort of quick analysis uh, that you, you know, may not merit all the time for a chemical transport model. Let me just kind of uh, give one example of that. So um, many of you will remember several years ago when, uh, you know, it was determined that Volkswagen uh, was, uh, you know, emitting more NOx from their automobiles uh, than uh, they were supposed to be. And uh, a couple of us, um, well, first of all, down here is a, a paper in ESNT published on the topic, but even earlier than that, um, a couple of us got, uh, you know, questions from reporters about uh, what the likely uh, health impact of that, uh, given the amount of NOx uh, emitted, uh, was that likely to uh, lead to, you know, a, a number of mortalities and, and uh, you know, we did some analysis really very quickly in a matter of a couple hours with the reporter uh, that said, yes, several dozen premature deaths are likely to have resulted from that amount of NOx emissions. Um, 
And so those are the kinds of things that you might not break out a chemical transport model to do, um, but are really very easy to do with these kinds of models. Um, another way that I like to kind of uh, talk about these are, so those of you who think about climate policy at all, um, may know about certain impact metrics that are exist in kind of decision analysis. So you may know the social cost of carbon, the dollars of climate damages per ton of CO2 emitted. Uh, you may know about the global warming potential if you want to uh, compare, for example, methane emissions to CO2. Um, these are numbers that are, again, very easy for people to use and to bring into a, a decision or policy analysis. Uh, we're trying to do something very similar here in the air quality space. Uh, what makes it more complicated is that in the climate space, um, these are just single numbers. You know, the social cost of carbon, you know, 30 or $40 per ton is a typical number that you hear. Um, and that's because it doesn't matter where you emit CO2. Uh, the climate effect is the same, it's long lived. When you're talking about air pollution, air quality, you need to think about where people are, where the emissions are, who's being exposed. Um, all this has to be much more uh, spatially resolved. So we're still producing numbers that are social costs, dollars of, in this case, health damages, uh, premature mortality from PM 2.5 per ton of some pollutant emitted. But now it has to be a function of location. So emitting a ton of SO2 in Pennsylvania has different health consequences than emitting a ton of SO2 in Montana, for example. Um, one of the things, again, that we're trying to do is a lot of the work in energy systems um, does a whole bunch of sophisticated analysis on the energy systems, on the, the, the technology side, and then often the endpoint is quantifying the change in the emissions rather than pushing on to the next steps where you think about changes in air quality concentrations, changes in people's health or monetized benefits. And we wanted to give people sort of easy tools to go from emissions to certainly health and monetized benefits and even concentrations in some cases where they would want that. Um, and so this is kind of a, a typical schematic of what a regulatory impact assessment might look like. You might have baseline emissions, new emissions, you run air quality simulation in a chemical transport model, you get changes in PM 2.5 concentrations. And then with a concentration response relationship, you say how many premature mortalities are caused or avoided, um, or what the rate of that is. With the exposed population, you get an absolute change in premature deaths. And then if you want to take it into economic terms, you apply something called a value of a statistical life to get a, a social cost in terms of dollars. And again, kind of the, not that these later steps are non-trivial, but, but it's certainly this first step that's the heavy lifting in terms of computation and complexity. Usually we do that with chemical transport models. Um, and so we wanted to see if we could sort of uh, eliminate that bottleneck by using reduced form models, reduced complexity models. Uh, and then again, our output is usually uh, the dollar of damages per an extra ton of a certain pollutant at a certain location. So we have been very fortunate with uh, EPA funding to have uh, the CASA Center, Center for uh, Air Climate Energy Solutions. And so in that center, we actually have uh, three different groups with three different reduced complexity models um, that I'll mostly be talking about today. Um, there's something called the APEEP model that was developed by my colleague, Nick Muller, uh, who is now at Carnegie Mellon. He did a lot of this uh, early work and development at Middlebury before coming over to CMU a couple of years ago. Um, the short description of the APEEP uh, model is that it's a Gaussian dispersion model layered with some very simple chemistry to convert precursors to PM 2.5. Um, easier, uh, which is the one developed in my group, uh, started by my former PhD student, Jin Hyuk Ho, um, it takes an entirely different approach. We start with a CTM simulation. We start with CAMEX. Uh, we do 
ag simulations where we emit a little bit of extra um, precursor into different grid cells of the model. The tagging lets us uh, say where those uh, plumes go, and then we fit a statistical model to those results to come up with a broader lookup table that covers the whole United States. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, the third model here is the InMap model uh, developed by uh, Chris Tessum when he was a PhD student with Julian Marshall um, at University of Washington in Minnesota. Chris is now starting a faculty position at Illinois. Um, InMap is a little bit different structurally. It's uh, like a chemical transport model, but it runs in an annual average sense. And I'll say a little bit more about that in some following slides. Um, so I, I'm going to say just a little bit more about each one of these models. Um, I, I think the take home point though, uh, before getting into some of the details is we have three different reduced complexity models, all derived in really pretty different ways. And so I consider these to be fully independent uh, estimates of the same thing. And so to the extent that these models agree with each other, I would say is a, um, a pretty strong indication that we're on the right track. Um, so the AP model really, for those of you who know CRDM, the climatological uh, regional dispersion model, uh, it really goes back uh, to those roots. Uh, again, it's a Gaussian dispersion model with some fairly simple oxidation treatment and some simple thermodynamics to convert uh, these PM 2.5 precursors to PM 2.5 uh, concentrations. It's built off the, the EPA NEI, uh, so annual emissions for a whole number of you know, area and point sources. It's fundamentally county resolution, um, and these are the pollutants that it uh, uh, includes, basically PM 2.5 and all the major uh, precursors. And just to give you um, a little bit of an example of what um, uh, all of these models are doing under the hood, but this is, I'll use APEEP as an example. Uh, this is a case where uh, we're emitting, I'm getting a little bit of lag here with the laser pointer. Um, we're emitting an additional ton of SO2 from a power plant called RE Burger which is you know, right here in uh, Eastern Ohio along the uh, Ohio River. Uh, and then based on the dispersion model with the simple chemistry, the PM 2.5 change that you see in the surrounding counties is, is what you see plotted in this map. And so you see a plume, this is annual average, so you see impacts in all the directions, but you see more impact you know, in the eastward direction in the downwind prevailing wind direction. Um, and so that's, the, the air quality results. Then we take it one step further, and this is, um, you know, we go from the concentration response function, uh, the number of people exposed to each of those PM 2.5 levels that I just showed you, uh, the mortality rates, and then monetizing those damages into economic terms. And what you see on this map is, um, where the damage, how big and where the damages occur from the extra ton of SO2 from, from the power plant in Eastern Ohio. Um, you can see maybe not surprisingly that the largest, the county with most, or not most of, but the largest damages uh, is Allegheny County where Pittsburgh is. Um, you can see, you know, damages uh, throughout the Northeastern United States and basically every major urban area uh, in the Northeast you can see again, significant number of damages. So here's Washington DC and surrounding areas. Here's Philadelphia, uh, here's New York. You even see things showing up, you know, Boston, Rochester, Buffalo, and so on. And so this is the result of the PM 2.5 uh, concentrations, but also of course, where the downwind affected populations are. So that's kind of what, um, all of the models are, are doing under the hood. And then if you add up all these damages across the whole uh, region, that would be the, the dollar damages per ton of SO2 from that particular location. Um, Easier does something kind of similar, but it does it in uh, a full chemical transport model. We use CAMEX. 
Uh, we use tag simulations. And so what you can see on this plot is again an example where uh, I think there's 50 different locations that we've picked uh, semi-randomly across the United States. We emit uh, a little bit of extra, I think in this case, elemental carbon, and then we can see the surrounding increase in the PM 2.5 uh, linked to those uh, emissions. And then again, uh, we can do the exposure and the health impact to say uh, for an additional ton at any one of these locations, uh, what are the monetized damages? And so this, shows you uh, a similar kind of uh, picture. I think every star here is one of the 100 locations that we've done in the chemical transport model. And just to give you a sense for how much location matters, if you emit elemental carbon you know, here near Philadelphia, the damages are basically half a million dollars per ton of elemental carbon. Whereas here in uh, uh, Eastern Wyoming, it's uh, two orders of magnitude smaller. It's a few thousand dollars per ton. And that's mostly just a function of uh, exposed population. Um, the tag simulations let us do this for a large number of uh, areas in the country, but it doesn't let us do it for every county or every grid cell. So then we use a statistical model to try to fit these results. We train this, it's just a regression model where we try to say what the per ton social cost is as a function of uh, exposed population in the surrounding area and a bunch of other atmospheric variables. Um, we have 100 locations that we've done rigorously in the CTM. We train the regression model based on 50 of those locations, and then we use 50 other locations as independent tests. And just to kind of give you some sense for the evaluation, um, this is the dollar per ton on the x-axis that you would get uh, straight out of CAMEX from doing it rigorously in a chemical transport model. On the y-axis, this is what the statistical model gives you. So this is what the easier reduced complexity model gives you. Um, and you can see that the fractional bias is about 10%. The error for any uh, given location is about 50% on average. Um, and I will note here that I'm actually showing you the worst case scenario. Um, this is Knox in the summertime. Uh, all the other, Knox is the hardest one. All the other species actually perform better than this. Uh, and even Knox in every other season performs uh, better, this, better than this. And Knox is actually the, um, Knox in the summertime is actually the one with the, um, the lowest damages per ton. So it's kind of, uh, a nice feature that we we have the worst performance and actually the the case where the damages are the least important. Um, so the the last model in the suite of three is Nmap. Um, like I said, this one is the most uh, CTM like. There's a three dimensional uh, uh, grid of cells. Uh, the major differences to a full fledged CTM is the, the processes are simplified uh, and they're usually using annual average kind of rate constants and parameters. Uh, and instead of time, the, the reason that InMap can be faster than a regular CTM is instead of time stepping like every 15 minutes through a year, like a traditional CTM, InMap uh, tries to iterate uh, a few iterations and get to an annual average uh, PM 2.5 concentration. So essentially cuts out uh, all the time variability. Uh, a nice feature of InMap is it has variable resolution grid going to as fine as one kilometer resolution in, in urban areas. Um, so again, I said this before, we have three different reduced complexity models, all derived in very different ways. And so to the extent that they agree, um, I consider that to be a fairly robust uh, estimate of the impacts of a, a ton of emission. Um, this is an important table that um, is something that I is often very confusing for people who are coming in and trying to pick up these models. I'll, I'll do my very best to try to make this part clear. Um, you know, the term reduced complexity model or, or model, I think using the word model tends to give people the wrong impression of um, what's going on here. 
uh, there are models involved, but there's, there's different layers. Each one of these reduced complexity models is more like a family of tools derived with a common set of assumptions and you can interact and use their results in different levels of detail depending on what your needs are. The, the simplest one is the one that I've really been talking about. And this is actually the one that I think most users are really want. It's what we call the marginal social costs. Again, it's the dollar of damages per ton of emission. Um, it's important to note this is aggregate downwind damages. So the, basically you have a dollar per ton number for every source location and for every species that you might emit. Um, but it's source oriented. So if I say that uh, the damages from emitting a ton of elemental carbon near Philadelphia was like half a million dollars, as I showed in the, that previous slide, that means if you emit elemental carbon at that location, there will be half a million dollars of damages somewhere in the United States. So it's summing up all the downwind receptors uh, and giving you the aggregate number. Uh, all three reduced complexity models give you these marginal social costs. Essentially, it's a lookup table. So the analysis is very simple. Um, if you have an emission scenario, uh, you, just start, you just need to start multiplying emissions rates uh, in each location by the corresponding social cost and, and then add up the damages or benefits. Um, so we've tried to make this easy. So the three reduced complexity models uh, that I just described are all available on the CASES website, www.cases.us. With one fairly simple web query, you can get uh, a spreadsheet um, with all the values for any species or locations that you're interested in. Um, and this is really just spreadsheet analysis with a lookup table. I sometimes tell people this is simple enough that I even do it myself. I don't even make my PhD students do it. Um, and so the typical analysis is, is often just a few hours to get something done. Uh, and this works great when you're really doing kind of a cost benefit type analysis. If you're just worried about the aggregate damages from a policy or from an emissions change and you're not too worried about where those locations are happening. Um, if you want to go to another level of de detail, again, all three reduced complexity models will give you a source receptor matrix. Um, so if you are changing uh, emissions in a given location and you want to know who is affected downwind and where, you'll need to go to the source receptor matrix. Uh, and then this will give you the impacts at every single location downwind as a function of where the emissions are coming from, the source location, and of course by species. Um, all three RCMs have source receptor matrices available. Uh, it's a lot more data than the marginal social costs. Uh, we are working on trying to put them together into some sort of common easily used framework, but it's a heavier lift. Um, all three source receptor matrices are available uh, in different formats on the websites of the individual RCMs. But the point is, if, if you want to reconstruct pollutant concentrations as a function of location, if you want to do environmental justice or any other um, um, analysis where you really want to say where the damages are happening and who they're happening to, you're going to need the source receptor matrix. And that's, you know, at least an order of magnitude more complex than doing this marginal social cost, cost benefit <coughs> style analysis. And then last but not least, um, uh, rather than just using the lookup table or a source receptor matrix, you can actually get your hand on the underlying model uh, that, that these two things are derived from. So you can certainly get NMAP, you can get APEEP. Um, that's a heavier lift because then you're really running something more like a real model. Um, I don't include easier on here, because the underlying model is ultimately really CAMEX and the statistical model that sort of sits in between um, is not really particularly um, useful outside of uh, these other kinds of approaches of marginal social costs and source receptor matrix. Um, so again, just saying it another way, 
uh, there's a couple things that you might want to do with a reduced complexity model. If you're just doing cost benefit analysis, you just want to know total benefits and damages and you're not so concerned about where they are. That's very easy to do now with the marginal social costs, just a few hours of work. If uh, you want to know where the damages occur or reconstruct a concentration field, you need the source receptor matrix. Definitely doable, but it's, uh, you know, it's more than just a web query and a, and a couple hours of work. It's, it's more of a significant analysis step. Um, I've talked a little bit about the differences of the three reduced complexity models. I've summarized some of that here. Um, a couple things that are worth mentioning. In general, uh, definitely all three of these models, the end point that they're considering is PM 2.5 mortality. That is usually 90 plus percent of the, um, the value damages in any cost benefit analysis that includes air pollution. Um, but APEEP does do morbidity, it does do ozone and a bunch of other uh, endpoints. So there are specific reasons that you might want to use APEEP easier or InMAP uh, if you have very specific demands for a certain question. Um, and I've tried to highlight some of the, the unique parts of each model here. But the, the real point I would like to make is, you know, because these are reduced complexity models and no model is perfect, even the state of the art models are imperfect. Uh, our general recommendation is to use all three of them uh, as a sensitivity robustness check. And again, we've made it easy on the web to get all three of them in one fell swoop and to do the analysis all together. So there's really no reason not to, to look at the results from all three of these reduced complexity models. Um, just to kind of give you a sense for what the uh, marginal social costs look like, these are the results from uh, easier. Uh, and, you know, again, depending on the pollutant precursor, elemental carbon, SO2, NOx, or ammonia, uh, and then depending on the location, these are the maps of the damages. So again, anywhere in the northeastern United States, if you emit a ton of elemental carbon, you're talking about more than 10 to the fifth, more than $100,000 of damages per ton of elemental carbon. I've put the national average values down here uh, below each panel. You can see again, uh, not surprisingly, emitting primary PM 2.5, uh, you emit a ton of elemental carbon, you already have a ton of PM 2.5. So on average, that gives you the biggest uh, damage. Um, SO2 and ammonia uh, are gas phase precursors. So you emit a ton of SO2, you don't necessarily get a ton of PM 2.5, uh, but you can see that the impacts are a little bit lower uh, for that reason, because uh, uh, there's this, the step of only a fraction of the SO2 is actually going to form sulfate, for example. And then NOx is the least effective in forming PM 2.5 and has the lowest damages on average. And this, um, you know, for anyone who knows uh, about the chemistry of PM 2.5 formation, uh, should make uh, total sense. This is what you would expect. Again, these are the damages by source location. It's just a lookup table that you use. Um, and the trends here all make uh, total sense. Of course, you know, the closer you are to population centers, the larger the damages. Uh, and the differences by species are, are what you would expect based on their propensity to form PM 2.5. Um, I've talked quite a bit about the, the air quality simulation. I want to say a little bit about these later steps. Again, to the extent that there's people online who are more focused on the air quality modeling may be less familiar with some of these steps. And it's important to know something about them to make sense of the results uh, that you'll be getting from a reduced complexity model. So the concentration response function, this comes from uh, various epidemiological studies about PM 2.5. Uh, this is kind of the, the classic concentration response function that the additional mortality you get from a, a concentration change over here depends on the baseline mortality. And the key number that comes out of an epi study is something called the relative risk R here. The two most important epi studies, well, uh, there's, these have a little competition now, but certainly the ones that 
really bound the effect are the ACS and the Harvard Six Cities studies. They have a different um, relative risk observed in each one of those uh, studies. So in ACS, they saw a 6% increase in the mortality rate per 10 microgram per cubic meter of PM 2.5 uh, pollution. Um, in Harvard Six Cities, they saw a 14% increase in the mortality rate. Um, the other thing is uh, value of statistical life. And again, if you're not an economist, this takes a little bit of uh, work to wrap your head around. Um, this is the willingness to pay of an average American to avoid some small risk of dying. Um, so an example would be all else being equal, if you have a choice between two jobs that are otherwise identical, if there's a job that's more dangerous, you would expect that you would be compensated a little bit more for that. Um, and so it's people's willingness uh, to pay, for example, for safety equipment or willingness to be paid to assume more risk in a dangerous uh, job. Uh, it's not an ethical statement about the value or compensation that should be paid. It's not a philosophical statement about the value of you know, an individual's life. Uh, there's a branch of the economics literature that tries to infer people's preferences from market behaviors. Um, and so it's just a way of trying to represent the average American's willingness to trade, you know, dollars for risk and safety. Uh, so it's a, a willingness to pay metric. Uh, it is not the literal hospital, medical, lost days of work or kind of uh, observable market, observable things that you would see in the market as kind of the direct um, costs. And so um, the EPA has a literature review. It represents, or it recommends about $7 million in 2006 dollars uh, as a value of statistical life. So what that means is we as a society uh, should be willing to sp spend about $7 million um, for a policy that would save uh, a life or per life saved. Um, this number, of course, is not written in stone. At a minimum, uh, it has to be adjusted for inflation like any other price, essentially. Um, it also uh, increases um, with income. So it is a willingness to pay measure. Uh, and so economists observe that people with more income are more willing to pay for uh, health, safety, uh, et cetera. And so uh, it has to be adjusted with per capita income or GDP and also with uh, inflation. Um, this literature review looks at a large number of studies and, and comes up with a $7 million um, recommendation. I'll talk a little bit about some of the evaluation that we've done uh, of the RCMs individually, as well as um, collectively against each other. So this is a sample of uh, evaluating easier. Uh, and so this is for the different precursors that we consider, primary PM 2.5, SO2, NOx, ammonia, uh, in the different seasons, winter, spring, summer, fall, the fractional bias and the fractional error uh, that we get. And I showed you on an earlier slide, NOx in the summertime, and I said that was the worst. Here it is over here. The fractional error that we get from um, easier compared to what we'd get from a CTM, typically in any given location, it's a 20 or 30% error in the damages. Um, so this is using the good and excellent uh, criteria outlined in this Morris et al. article. Um, you know, if you look at evaluation of CTMs versus observations, you see similar kinds of bias and error. So given that uh, we can give you similar answers uh, from a lookup table um, with, um, you know, errors that are not very different from a CTM, uh, it seems to me a, a, good, a good deal from that standpoint, at least for certain applications. Um, all right, I want to push on and, and cover a few other things. This is some of the inner comparison work that we've done between the three uh, reduced complexity models. So top row is APEEP, 
second row is easier, third row is nmap for the different species going across. What you see here are box and whisker plots for the marginal social costs for every county in the country. And this is to show you essentially that they're broadly, uh, you know, if, if you go vertically across models, uh, they're broadly very consistent with each other. And again, the differences that we see, uh, you know, species by species uh, and location by location are match you know, your common sense and scientific understanding, they also tend to be very consistent with each other. Um, the red dots are the emissions weighted national averages. So if you somehow uh, were reducing SO2 or NOx emissions kind of uniformly on a percentage basis across the, across the whole country, the, the benefits that you would get per ton would be this red dot. And again, if you compare the red dots that you get um, from these different models, they're generally within 50% of each other. Uh, the error is a little bit larger for NOx. And again, that's not surprising. NOx is kind of, NOx and nitrate are the hard parts of uh, PM 2.5 to model. Um, a little bit more inner comparison here. And so, so this is drilling down into uh, maps location by location. So these are all 3,000 counties in the United States. What you see plotted here is the ratio of marginal social cost in map to easier. So the dollar per ton number that you get for primary PM 2.5 in each county compared to each other. If it's white, they're within a factor of two. So they agree within a factor of two what the of what the damages would be from emitting primary PM 2.5 from that location. You know, the light blue and this kind of orangish color is like a factor of two to four difference. And then around the edges, there's some, some bigger differences. So locally, uh, the models can disagree quite a lot on kind of broader regional and national scales. They tend to do quite well. Um, the scatter plot that you see on the right here is the same sort of comparison. Um, because there's 3,000 counties, the scatter plot actually shows the, the density. So the sort of dark blue and blue here is where most of the counties fall, pretty close to the one-to-one -one line. And then there's a smaller number of counties, in this case, where in-map uh, tends to be higher than easier, or easier is, uh, sorry, easier is higher than in-map, in-map's uh, lower than easier for some counties is what that's showing. Um, the correlation coefficient is high, meaning that if easier thinks uh, emitting primary PM 2.5 in a particular county is very bad, uh, InMap tends to agree and they tend to agree on which uh, counties have lower social costs. Um, this is primary PM 2.5 again, but showing the other pair of models, AP to InMap. Um, here you see a little bit of a systematic difference. So again, in the scatter plot, um, APEEP tends to be a little bit lower than NMAP, uh, almost by a factor of two on average, but again, very high correlation in terms of you know, what locations each model says uh, have the worst damages per ton. And then again, not to show you kind of all, of, these are sort of some of the better results. Uh, this is NOx between APEEP and easier. And you can see that there are uh, some broad regions of the country uh, and particularly some important regions of the country with a lot of people where the, the differences are an order of magnitude between APEEP and easier. There's not a lot of correlation in this particular comparison. Uh, um, here I want to say, you know, some good news that has come out of this. This is uh, the APEEP2 model when we did the inner comparison. The, this rather significant difference that we saw between APEEP uh, and the other two models was really a primary motivation for the, the update from APEEP2 to APEEP3, which now compares um, much better to the other two models. And again, knowing that NOx is the complicated one um, uh, and knowing that APEEP is, uh, makes some of the more severe uh, simplifications in terms of chemistry, this wasn't a total surprise, but, but we found some ways to address the issue. Um, you know, in the interest of time, I don't think I want to spend a lot of time on this. This is, but this was an exercise of using the models to try to predict uh, concentrations around the country and compare to observations. 
And so there's the three reduced complexity models and then morph chem. You know, in general, the performance of the RCMs in comparing to observations is not really materially worse than say uh, a, a chemical transport model. So um, again, there, you do lose some fidelity when you go to a reduced complexity model, but you gain a lot of usability. Uh, and so it's a trade-off that's certainly worth it for many applications. All right, I wanna spend a little bit of time um, talking about some of the how-to and to give you some samples of how this would work uh, in action. So this was a, a simple calculation that I did for the CMAS meeting down in North Carolina, where if you wanted to know what are the damages associated with swine production in North Carolina, um, my starting point was just to pull from the NEI, the ammonia emissions associated with swine production across all the counties uh, in North Carolina. So you can see that plotted here, how many tons per year uh, you know, in each of the counties. So this is numbers that you can get straight out of uh, NEI and that would be the starting point for your analysis. Um, the next thing you need to know is you need to know the damage associated with each one of those tons. And so you go to the cases homepage um, and in particular the RCM query page uh, that I've shown there you run, you know, you have to input that you want ammonia from uh, North Carolina. If you want to get all the species for all the counties, you can also do that. You can get the whole data set, but if you just want a subset, you can do that. Um, you have to input your email address. We don't harass you. We don't email anybody, but this is just so you can get a link back uh, to download. When I've done this, I get the links back, you know, within a minute. Um, and so when you uh, pull the data from this web query, this is what it looks like. So there's a FIPS code <coughs> that tells you the county, the state is listed as well, the pollutant uh, is listed. Here's the model, APEEP, easier InMap. Uh, APEEP and InMap are annual averages. Easier has an annual average, but it will also give you different numbers by season. Uh, you can get damages for elevated or ground level sources. And then this is the number you want. This is the dollar per ton uh, damages. And of course you don't necessarily want all these significant figures, but this is just how the data comes. Um, this is just the first few lines. Uh, you would have something like this for every county uh, that you're asking for. Um, and then this is what my final spreadsheet looks like, you know, about an hour later. Um, so again, FIPS code, name of the county, so with a little bit of you know, spreadsheet sorting and copying and pasting and lining things up, here's the emissions data by county. Again, that comes straight from the NEI. Here are the marginal social costs that you get from uh, our web tool in dollars per ton for AP easier and InMap. And then this is the aggregate damages. Um, and so this is literally uh, this is why these things are a lookup table and it's spreadsheet analysis. You take the emissions, you multiply by the uh, per ton damages and you get an aggregate damage number. Uh, and then you can sum up all the counties to get the total <coughs> damages valued. Um, and if you wanna convert it back to the number of premature mortalities, you can do that as well. Uh, I'll talk about that in just a minute. But it's really, again, it's an hour of kind of copying and pasting and sorting in a spreadsheet uh, to do this kind of analysis. And then the results uh, will look something like this. So again, here's the emissions that you started with. Here's the dollar per ton um, damages from InMap uh, as just an example. Then you multiply these numbers county by county and you can see, you know, not surprisingly, you get most of the damages associated with emissions where, you know, from counties where most of the emissions are. Um, so that's just kind of to give you some sense for how uh, easy these calculations are. Um, some other kinds of nuts and bolts that you might um, care about is you might want to change some of the assumptions. And so when you download the dollar per ton numbers from our website, there's already two important assumptions that are baked into those numbers. So the concentration response function, so everything we know about epidemiology is in that relative risk number. And then the valuation from economics is in the VSL, value of statistical life number. 
Um, if you don't like the default assumptions in the model and you want to change those, um, that's very easy to do uh, because basically the damages are proportional to the relative risk and they're proportional to the VSL. So you can make uh, a correction factor for concentration response. You can make a correction factor for VSL and you can take our base default marginal social costs in dollars per ton and adjust them to reflect assumptions more of your liking. Um, so let me just say a little bit about that. So again, the relative risk from the ACS is uh, 6% um, for 10 micrograms per cubic meter. So that's a relative risk of 1.06. One in this case means no effect. So what really matters is the stuff here after the decimal point. Harvard six cities, it's 1.14. So again, ignoring the one, uh, the difference between 0.14 to 0.06, these epi studies are different by a little bit more than a factor of two. They're different by a factor of 2.3. So essentially, the correction factor for changing from ACS to Harvard Six Cities is just subtract one off of both these numbers and do the ratio. So uh, if you go from ACS to Harvard Six Cities, all your damages are just gonna be 2.3 times higher. It's as simple as that. Uh, changing the VSL is a similar kind of story. Um, there's several reasons you might wanna change it. Again, there's uncertainty in the economics literature about what the underlying VSL number is. Um, uh, I said per capita income, economic growth increases people's willingness to pay, and then it also changes with inflation. Um, if you use BenMap, uh, it already has a bunch of tools for dealing with these things. Um, and so you can look at how BenMap adjusts these things. Uh, and you can do a similar kind of correction factor for the VSL. Um, our web tool right now will let you select a VSL either by year or just by simply inputting a dollar value that you want. Again, if you don't like our default assumptions. Um, uh, in terms of you know, uncertainty, in terms of the air quality computation, I'll, I'll repeat that we strongly recommend you use all three reduced complexity models. In terms of national and regional averages, they'll give you very similar answers. But if you're looking at a very localized uh, situation that's maybe mostly dependent on NOx, you can get bigger differences at times. Um, remember that the three RCMs are really independently derived. So again, if you get a similar result in your analysis, from the three RCMs, I think that's a strong robustness check. And then we just talked about how you would uh, do sensitivity or uncertainty for concentration response function or VSL. Um, if you don't want to report monetized damages, if you just want to report premature mortality, this is also straightforward. Since the damages are the number of mortalities times value of statistical life, and that's the we assume that most people are doing cost benefit and wanna go straight to damages. If you wanna go back to the premature mortality step, uh, it's just take the total damages, divide by your value of statistical life, and then you're back to the premature mortalities. Um, I wanna say just a couple more things and then open it up for questions. Um, something else that's important in using these marginal social costs, they are marginal social costs in kind of the economic sense of the uh, word, which is this is answering the question around a certain air quality baseline, for example, present day emissions, present day air quality. If you make a small change in emissions, uh, what is the small change of damages that you get? So it's a sensitivity derivative marginal change kind of number. So strictly speaking, they only apply in the limit of very small emissions changes and around the baseline uh, air quality. So you can to give it like a, a first order Taylor series approximation around uh, the model's baseline. So um, you should be cautious for very large emissions changes or policy changes that are happening around uh, you know, a distant future case. Um, we are doing a bunch of work trying to evaluate how much of an issue this is. It's not a negligible issue, 
uh, but it's also not a deal breaker issue. The, the uncertainties that you get for larger policy changes due to nonlinearities uh, or for looking at, at future uh, changes tend to be kind of, again, it depends, tends to be 20, 30% uh, types of errors. So again, not negligible, but not necessarily deal breakers or, as well. Ammonia is the one that you'd probably want to um, worry about the most. And we hope to have some published guidance in the peer reviewed literature about this pretty soon. Um, in the interest of time, I'm gonna skip this. There's a little bit more detail here about what I just said. Um, uh, for larger counties, especially in the West, you might wonder about um, what sorts of error do you get from assuming uh, a uniform value for emissions anywhere in the, in the county. Since NMAP has higher resolution inherently, uh, we asked Chris to look at this, and this is the percent difference that you get um, between the county average and, um, and the locations at different points within the county according to NMAP. And you can see, again, for, for not so much for secondary kind of precursors, but for primary PM in big counties with urban areas like LA, it can be up to about 50% different. Uh, but for a lot of places and locations, it's really a non-issue. So again, something to keep in mind depending on the application that you're interested in. Um, where do we plan to go uh, next? So we want to um, think more about supporting environmental justice analyses. And so uh, we're building a much higher resolution version of easier. We wanna get a bunch of EJ metrics on to our web query to make those as easy as the marginal social costs. Uh, and we wanna make uh, the source receptor matrices in a, a common format uh, with some tools that are easier to use. Uh, and this would let you take say emissions in a GIS file, run it through the source receptor matrix of any of these models and get a, a, like a, G, uh, a GIS output of the concentrations or the damages. Um, and we have this right now for two of the three models in a consistent format. I'll give you the, the um, URL for that at the very end. Um, and we also wanna update the treatment of VOCs and SOA uh, uh, inherent in these models to reflect um, some more recent state of the science. And so <clears throat> for more information, uh, I'm always happy to answer questions about these. Again, uh, the CASES website is a starting point. We've got uh, a guidance document there. Um, each of the three reduced complexity models had their own website before uh, the CASES project. And there's some more specific, in some cases, more detailed information still on some of these uh, websites that are sometimes useful for specific issues. And if you are interested in source receptor analysis, uh, look at Chris Tessum's blog, the URL here, uh, he has some Python-based tools uh, that are not terribly difficult to run that you can start to do source receptor analysis as well. Um, so to wrap up, um, I'm gonna go back to uh, the starting point, which is, again, the purpose of the reduced complexity models is not to replace chemical transport models. Um, the purpose of the reduced complexity model is to bring air quality analysis to a wider uh, research community, so energy policy people um, that would never run a CTM can now get good air quality numbers uh, from a lookup table that they would never be able to incorporate in their analysis um, before these tools existed. Um, it allows you to do different kinds of questions, so even if you're a CTM modeler, there there might be things that are just hard to do because you can't run a CTM a thousand times that running an RCM um, you can do. Uh, and I, I really only scratched the surface in some of the evaluation that we've done, but I'm feeling you know, pretty good about these tools overall. No tool is perfect. There's definitely some kind of edge cases and specific scenarios in which case you can get um, bigger differences between models. But again, we've made it easy for you to get answers from the three reduced complexity models in one step 
and see if you're getting uh, uh, a robust result or not. Uh, we've done a bunch of evaluations and I think this stuff, you know, passes the, the common sense uh, test. We've tried to make things user friendly and uh, publicly available. So um, uh, I'll end it there. Uh, there's time for discussion and feedback. I see a bunch of questions in the Q&A pane. Uh, Sarav, how do you want to uh, uh, handle questions? Yeah, um, thanks for the um, briefing, um, Peter. If you want to just start from the top and go through that, um, and I'll chime in as necessary. I did take care of a few uh, ones, but if you want to work off of the open set of questions in the Q&A panel from the top, that'll be great. Okay, I'll just work my way down and um, seeing a number of questions, I'll try to be a little brief on each one. Uh, so first question for the RE Burger power plant example, how do you determine the counties in which the results are significant? Uh, it seems that the concentrations modeled in counties far from the source are really small. Um, so the, the short answer to that is, um, you know, it's not obvious in the contour plot where you have to sort of uh, you know, just pick colors for different ranges of damages. Uh, but, but the tool looks at damages in all 3,000 counties of the United States. So even for that power plant, there's some number for what the damages, you know, are on the west coast of California. It's a very small number, no doubt, but it's, it's, it's in there and included. So there's no arbitrary um, kind of boundary that is, um, Kind of put around these tools. Um, I guess another thing that I'll say that's sort of interesting is when you look at where the damages occur, of course it depends on the scenario you're looking at, but generally you have to go 500 kilometers downwind, even a thousand kilometers downwind to get 80 or 90 percent of the damages. So you really have to think about this on a regional scale. Um, so the next question, how is error propagating from the 3D CTM to the reduced complexity model? Um, if there's a 50% difference between the two, how much off are you compared to real air quality? Um, so I'll say for APEEP in, um, in MAP where there isn't really a, a, a CTM run first, it's really not an error propagation, but for easier, um, the you know, the CTM of course has errors compared to the real world and then easier, we tune it to the CTM, but it won't be tuned perfectly to the CTM. So there's an additional layer of errors. Those should be independent. And so they, they propagate, uh, not in an additive sense, but in the, um, you know, in the way that you would sort of uh, propagate sigmas uh, between a couple different normal distributions. And so if, um, you know, if there's a 30% difference between the CTM and the real world and the 30% difference between easier and the CTM, uh, I can't do that math off the top of my head, but it's not a 60% difference. It's like a 45 or 50% difference. So again, it's think about propagating compounding errors between independent normal distributions. It's, it's, it's that kind of thing. Um, third question. Um, are these models adaptable uh, to Canada? And actually the next question is, are all three limited to the contiguous um, uh, United States? Um, so uh, a few different uh, answers to that. Um, so the, in the, their current form, they are really US centric tools. Uh, so that is uh, a limitation. Uh, there's some exceptions, and I actually I should have put this on the future work slide. Um, uh, some of these models, for example, uh, 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 easier, the underlying CAMAX CTM, you know, the way the boundaries are drawn uh, includes most of Ontario, for example. So a good chunk of the Canadian population is actually covered, uh, and you don't get that from our um, default web tool, but if you want those numbers, we can get you those numbers. If you go back to the easier web page, uh, they should be there because you, in that web page, you get them uh, from the model grid and not by US County. Um, and you can email me about that. Um, 
my colleague Elizabeth Gilmore is uh, uh, working on uh, adapting something similar specifically for the Canadian context. Um, another colleague, Amir Hakami, who, uh, and I've forgotten his institution, uh, uh, has done similar work. It's, it's essentially a reduced complexity model. Uh, you should look at his work for, if you're interested in, in Canada. There's a global version of InMap that is kind of uh, in a moderately advanced state of development. And we've also thought about some tools specific China, to China and India. Um, I have a PhD student. I have actually two PhD students who are working on um, building similar tools uh, for different regions of the world, uh, India and Africa included. And so uh, we're certainly aware that people are interested in this outside the United States and we're kind of rushing to meet that demand. Um, uh, let's see. I noted that Sarav had sort of marked some of these as I think sort of priority questions, but I think he's just sort of checking them off. The next question, just working my way down, uh, does that mean that VSL would be higher in a more affluent area given equal exposure? Um, people may not like the answer I'm about to give and don't shoot the messenger. If you talk to a classically trained economist, uh, the answer is yes. Um, think about it this way. Uh, if you look at uh, different households, when they go to buy cars, uh, all else being equal, a wealthier household is more likely to spend the extra, whatever, $500, $1,000, couple thousand dollars on the safety features. Economists see this, you know, it's not a value judgment, it's just an observation of how people behave. And since it is a willingness to pay, that's what the VSL is telling you. Uh, there are all kinds of sort of philosophical and ethical um, issues that might be, that you might object to about that. Uh, and I'm sympathetic to that, but that's just what the classical uh, economics would say. This is kind of the default way for doing cost benefit analysis uh, in the United States. Um, you know, fortunately, when the EPA applies it, they don't do it on a household basis. They take a, a US average number. Um, and that's what we've done as well. We've not used different VSL numbers for different parts of the country. You know, Manhattan doesn't get a higher VSL because they're richer people or anything like that. But um, it does mean that as you know, the country becomes more wealthy, the VSL goes up. Uh, and it does mean that if you're thinking about the international context, you need to wrestle with that issue a little bit. Um, <clears throat> next question, how is this methodology similar or different from CMAC uh, DDM? Um, I guess maybe a short answer to that is different methods, same goal in the end. Um, so, you know, DDM has, um, you know, it's sort of mathematically sophisticated tools that you run alongside the, C, the CMAC to get the sensitivity. We're also getting you the sensitivity numbers, um, uh, but using different methods. Uh, the results should be very comparable. Uh, I would say the more important difference is in the user experience. Again, if you're a CMAC user and you're very comfortable with CMAC and you just want to fire up DDM and run it alongside, that's great. More power to you. I, I, I really like, uh, I've never used DDM, but I really like that as a, an approach. Uh, again, you know, part of what we're trying to do is sort of reach people who would never run CMAC and therefore they would never run CMAC DDM. And by giving them something um, that's essentially a lookup table, I mean, you could imagine taking the CMAC DDM results for sensitivity per pollutant per location and just making a big lookup table out of them and publishing them. That's essentially what we've done. Um, so it'd be nice to see those numbers from CMAC DDM and, and do a comparison to them. Um, Let's see. 
Um, kind of scrolling through the questions. How is BenMap different and have you compared it with any of the models you presented? There's no meaningful differences. So BenMap is just um, a framework for, um, I guess if I'm gonna try to pop back to, um, um, can you still see my screen as I kind of push through the slides here, hopefully? Yes. So on, on this slide where I was talking about this kind of impact chain, there's the air quality simulation and then, you know, the exposure and the concentration response and then the value of statistical life. BenMap is really just a tool that does steps two, three, and four here. Uh, when we do those steps, we use equivalent assumptions as BenMap. Um, so we don't use BenMap per se, but we are doing the same kind of calculation. Um, and so there's really no meaningful difference. Again, when you're using BenMap or our tool, you have to think about uh, what's the relative risk, what's the concentration response function you're using, ACS or Harvard Six Cities, you need to think about your VSL. You need to do that in BenMap, you need to do that uh, in our framework as well. So it's, it's really equivalent. Um, let's see, I need to get back to the, somehow I'm going to the slides. I <coughs> seem to have lost the, the question and answer pane. Um, um, I, I can read them for you if, if you're not able to see them, uh, Peter. Yeah, why don't, why don't you step me through? Um, one good question is, do you have uh, any plans to reduce, uh, for reduce form models to function in the context of ozone? All the work you presented for PMs so far? Um, no concrete plans. I, I can say uh, two or three things uh, 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 right now. Um, if someone wanted to fund us to do it, I would happily do it. I guess it's the first thing I would say. Uh, the second thing is um, if you want numbers for that right now, um, um, go to APEEP. APEEP already has ozone in it. Um, uh, we haven't evaluated it and done inner comparisons the way we have for PM 2.5. Um, you know, so it's a little bit, little bit less, you know, vetted in that sense. Um, and I guess the other thing I would say is, you know, again, for, um, for most rules and policy assessments, you know, most of the damages are going to be from PM 2.5 and then often means, you know, 80, 90% or more. So there are a lot of scenarios where, you know, I, I hate to say this to, you know, some of my colleagues who like to do ozone, where ozone is a little bit within the noise of some of the other uncertainties, but there are other scenarios where you'd really want to have uh, the ozone. So for scenarios that are really focused almost exclusively on NOx, you know, in some parts of the country, there may be, you may get a lot of PM 2.5 from the NOx, and in some parts of the country, the damages may be primarily through ozone. So that's a scenario where um, you would really want to think about including ozone um, to be rigorous. Okay. Um, the other RCM out there is COBRA, EPA's COBRA. Do you have any thoughts about COBRA and how it compares to these three RCMs? Um, so we haven't done a detailed comparison. COBRA, like APEEP, is sort of in its guts built off the CRDM, Climatological Regional Dispersion Model. Um, so methods-wise, it should be very similar to APEEP. Um, um, you know, Nick has done some sort of evaluation and some associated recalibrations uh, for APEEP that would make it maybe uh, give results that are a little bit different than COBRA. But conceptually, methods-wise, it's, it's built on a very similar guts as COBRA. So I would think, you know, if we have, you know, there's APEEP1, APEEP2, APEEP3, you could think of COBRA as, you know, a, a cousin or something like that. Okay. Uh, how often does C CASES plan to update the baseline modeling that supports these RCMs? Well, uh, 
Cases is a five-year funded EPA center, and we're in, you know, year, we're at like year three and a half. Um, so what are our um, um, plans going forward? So within the, the remaining kind of year and a half lifespan, we want to do some of the things that I mentioned. Um, we want to um, uh, higher resolution easier. We want to uh, improve the underlying to, to redo the organics results with kind of more up to date uh, treatment of SOA, secondary organic aerosol, basically. We want to uh, bring some new capabilities in terms of environmental justice and source receptor. Along the way, we plan to, you know, also update the baseline. So, um, you know, currently uh, the easier numbers are built off of the 2005 NEI. Um, and so there are not dramatic night and day changes, but you know changes in SO2 and NOx that would that change some of them, uh, the sensitivities. And one of the slides that I skipped, but I'll just, Sarav, are you going to be putting slides online for people who want to kind of come back to some of these points? Yes, uh, we will be posting the slides as well as the recording for the full 90 minutes will be available for people to download and listen to later if they wish. Yeah, so here, here are some extra thoughts. And, you know, I, I, I've cited a couple papers here, Holt et al. and Pinder et al. Uh, that talk about how the sensitivities of PM 2.5 to different precursors have changed kind of over roughly the same time period. Um, and so you can you can get a sense for if you're using an older baseline, what kind of bias that might be. But as we do some of these other uh, uh, capabilities, like I said, easier right now, the numbers are based on the NEI 2005. Uh, we will be publishing new easier numbers based on more recent NEI as we do those analyses. And so, um, and then beyond the lifespan of the cases center, this is something that um, I think, well, Nick has been doing this a long time. I'm fairly sure I can, you know, speak with confidence that, that maintaining these tools in the future is something that Chris Tessum is very interested in and, and certainly I am as well. So, um, you know, we'll be looking for other ways to get funding to kind of keep developing and keep supporting these tools. Okay, so more on the training data set, somewhat tied to the baseline. So tell us more about the training data set used to train these RCMs and the applicability of the lookup table in the website. And associated comment is what level of expertise is needed to train these for a different region or a year? Um, yeah, to, I mean, to retrain, it, it, it's a bit of an effort if, um, uh, if someone is, you know, interested in doing that, I would say you're you're going to need you know, someone with expertise in air quality modeling, and you're probably going to need some months at least of their time. Is that's the kind of the level of, uh, and so if it if it's you know something that you're seriously interested in doing, and changing regions is is the same kind of thing, and so. You know, I've got a couple PhD students who are working on, you know, I mentioned India and Africa and, you know, those are going to be six to 12 month projects, at least for them. Um, so, so changing regions is, is a fairly heavy lift. Um, but if there's a, something specific you're interested in, I would say email me and um, um, I can certainly keep you apprised of our plans. Uh, retraining for years is not as hard as changing regions, but it's still, you know, you're, you know, it's still kind of months to sort of a paper's worth of work. So um, I would be, again, it depends on, you know, your resources and the context, but I would more likely, um, you know, use the social costs as they are, and then use some of the numbers that I've uh, kind of put here to, to estimate um, kind of what the magnitude of the bias is and, and then ask the question of, you know, is this going to, uh, 
change my recommendation. You know, actually, one thing I, I should take a big, big step back here in the context of, you know, policy analysis and decision analysis. Um, how big is a 10% error, or 30% error, or a factor of two error, you know, always depends uh, on the context and, and on the decision. Um, you know, when EPA does regulatory impact analysis for, you know, a rule that targets PM 2.5, uh, the benefit cost ratio is often 10 to 1, 50 to 1, 100 to 1. Um, and so, in some sense, a factor of two error might seem big, and in some contexts, it might be big. Uh, but if you're looking at um, a rule uh, or, you know, uh, an analysis that says that the, the benefit to cost ratio is 50 to 1, you know, a factor of two error means it could be 25 to 1 or it could be 100 to 1. But any way you slice that, uh, that's a good deal, right? That's, some, that's a, a decision that you would be you know, happy to recommend. And if you're the EPA doing it for real money, uh, you're going to run a CTM anyways. But if you're, um, you know, doing it more as a hypothetical, um, you know, as a think tank or as an academic uh, research exercise, you know, I think you would, uh, for the ease of use, uh, you'd, you'd happily sort of publish that and say, okay, factor of two, we're still fairly confident that there's a robust recommendation here that, that we like um, you know, wh whatever uh, policy or rule or scenario we're looking at. It looks good from a benefit cost analysis. Okay. Um, Peter, you have noted what these RCMs are good for. What applications might you warn against? Um, yeah, uh, equally good question. So I, I would say You know, and, and as a person who does CTM modeling and, and uh, can go either way, um, I, I would say the few scenarios are uh, some of the things I've sort of alluded to, but maybe try to recapitulate. Again, if you're the EPA and you're doing a major rule, you know, CARE, CASPER, Clean Power Plant, you know, anything of that magnitude, um, you know, you're going to want to run a CTM, even if the reduced complexity model gives you the same answer and it's robust, I think just because you're going to go to court and just because of the billions of dollars that are at stake, you just want to be able to say we did it with the most sophisticated state of the art tool. So that's one, you know, reason you would still do a CTM. Um, uh, if, you know, ammonia is kind of a, a problem, problematic one in terms of changing baselines. Uh, and so we have some preliminary work that we're going to hopefully be writing up pretty soon that, you know, the sensitivity of PM 2.5 to ammonia now versus maybe in 2050 uh, is fairly different. So if you're thinking about ammonia far in the future, um, I would, I would not recommend using these tools. Um, um, the other, the other one is, uh, you know, again, I, I showed some of the inner comparisons of the tools that, you know, sometimes a given tool will be a little higher for SO2 damages in the, you know, this location, but a little lower in this other location. And if you're looking at sort of broadly distributed SO2 changes across the country, a lot of those errors will kind of cancel out and you'll be happy with kind of the aggregate, uh, analysis, but, um, you know, we've seen very specific scenarios. I had a colleague <coughs> who was looking at, um, you know, some of the impacts associated with fracking, specifically in Western Pennsylvania. Uh, and she was, you know, so her scenario was, you know, pretty focused on, again, Western Pennsylvania. So, you know, a fraction of a state. Uh, I showed you the map where she was using easier and APEEP at the time. Uh, and this is one of the regions where those, uh, most of those damages are associated with NOx emissions. It's, um, you know, diesel engines and, and trucks driving around. And so it was kind of the, the worst case scenario that it was, you know, the hardest species NOx 
in a very specific location where the two tools she was using diverged the most. Um, and I forget how big the difference was between the two tools, but it was definitely kind of enough that, well, she was glad that she looked at, you know, both sets of tools, certainly to have that um, uncertainty assessment. Um, so again, the more, the more Knox focused and the more local you are, um, the more, I wouldn't say stay away from, from the tools in that case, but definitely run all three tools. Again, you could get, get them all from the website. Uh, it's not really any extra time and just see if you're getting consistent answers or not. Okay, we have less than four minutes uh, remaining. Um, let's take two more short questions, Peter, and then I do have a couple of announcements before we wrap up. Um, sure. The next question for you is, how is metrology incorporated into these models? Yeah, so it's different for all three. Um, um, you know, because APEEP and NMAP are essentially annual average models, they have um, annual average uh, meteorology. So they have a little bit of, they have to kind of tune the dispersion uh, a little bit to account for the, you know, the variation in wind speed and direction that happens naturally over the year. Um, so more details than that, I didn't really have to kind of refer you to the papers. Um, and easier, it's, it's a different story. Um, because the starting point is we do tag simulations in CAMEX for a full year, um, you know, the, the underlying meteorology there is, is treated the same way as in any CTM simulation. Now, if you do CTM stuff, you're never 100% happy with your meteorological files, but we have, you know, reasonable time variation and so on and fairly rigorous treatment of processes. And then it's only at the final step that we do the statistical modeling on all the impacts. And so um, the other thing that I will add there, so again, um, you know, there's different approaches in these models. The first two that I mentioned, you know, they're, they're averaging the meteorology. So you might think, oh, well, you know, what sort of error does that uh, uh, cause? Whereas, you know, with easier, the, the meteorology is treating a, treated a little bit more rigorously and then the, the approximation comes in only at the final step. But, you know, when we do that, for like elemental carbon or primary PM 2.5 species where the result is really a function of transport, dispersion, and who gets exposed. This is when the three models really agree most closely. Um, and so what that tells me is, you know, even if, you know, even if you're a person that says, oh, Gaussian dispersion models are terrible, CTM is better, well, um, for the species where it really is purely just a dispersion issue, like, you know, elemental carbon, it's giving uh, us pretty much the same answer as a CTM approach. And so, you know, I have always seen in the Gaussian dispersion literature, oh, you shouldn't trust a Gaussian dispersion model past, say, 100 kilometers or something like that. Um, so here they're being applied on regional scales. And again, we've compared to numbers coming out of a CTM and they look extremely similar. So the Gaussian dispersion approaches seem to be holding up very well on, on regional scales. Great. Um, we have less than a minute, so let's pause here. And uh, we have a few questions we didn't get through, but at least some of them are on a similar vein to some of what already been discussed. Um, anyway, th thank you, Peter, for a great uh, briefing on these the reduced complexity models along with the uh, patients to answer all these questions after that. Uh, we will be posting both the slide deck and the recording on the CMAS webinar webpage. And the announcement I have is um, we've had three webinars back to back this year. And thank you all for your participation. And we plan to have more next year, for which um, we at the CMAS Center invite um, topics of interest from the community to see what you would like to hear from us as well as if you have a specific topic, um, either a specific modeling technique or an algorithm within the air quality modeling approaches, or there's an interesting analysis you're doing with the air quality modeling results uh, for your application you would like to present to the uh, community, please send an email to CMAS, that's C-M-A-F, at unc.edu, and we'll try to schedule more of these um, next year. 
with that thank you all for your interest and participation and happy holidays